So recently, someone I know was giving away Steam keys, and I got the key for a strategy game called Warlock, Master of the Arcane. And so, I figured I would go ahead and give it a review. The exact genre of strategy game Warlock is part of is the 4X genre. For those of you who do not know what the 4X stands for, it stands for Explore, Expand, Exploit, and Exterminate. Because whoever named the genre apparently did so phonetically. I am a fan of the genre, though my only experience actually playing a game from it is Civilization, so that was essentially the main baseline for comparison I had starting to play. Those of you who are familiar with Civilization will find yourselves in a sort of uncanny valley. The interface is very similar to Civ 5, but some of the controls are different. One thing that did take some getting used to, for instance, was that you cannot click and drag the screen to move it. This, and a few other differences, made the game seem very clunky and slow moving at first, but once I'd grown accustomed to the new controls, it was just as easy to use. So, in Warlock, Master of the Arcane, you play as one of the great mages, powerful wizards who are currently vying for control over the entire world. You can pick from one of several pre-designed characters, then optionally customize their skills to best suit your playstyle. The great mages do not just act as glorified avatars in this game, though. You take an active role in your empire's conquest by researching and casting spells to aid your armies or screw over your enemies. Rival great mages will not be the only threat you have to worry about, however. Neutral sides have small city-states scattered across the land, and they are neutral only in name. These city-states will go out of their way to attack anyone who approaches their borders, and do not negotiate with anyone. Monsters also have dens scattered across the land, which will continually spawn new monsters until they are conquered. Unlike barbarians in the Civilization games, however, these monsters will remain a threat even into the late game. New dens appear on a regular basis, and if left unchecked, can wreak havoc across your empire. It's not all bad news, though. Looting the monster dens can net you some loot in the form of gold, mana, artifacts, and even lords. Powerful soldiers who can be equipped with those artifacts to further enhance their power. There are three main races in the core game. Humans, who are the best at collecting gold but have a generally lackluster roster. Monsters, who are best at gathering food and have a few heavy hitters in their arsenal and the undead who are best at gathering mana, and have units that don't eat food as well as a few other advantages and disadvantages when compared to the other races. Personally, I find that I prefer to play as the humans. While their roster is weaker than the other two races, a larger supply of gold means being able to afford unit upgrades with ease, and rogues require only gold as upkeep, allowing you to field a large number of expendable units early on. One of the features of Warlock that stands out as being fairly unique is that there are sub-realms within the world that contain rare resources that can give you the upper hand if you're the first to find the portal. And if your army can survive the swarms of monsters that have almost certainly spawned in the time it takes you to find it. These realms are also the only places where you can find dragon's eggs, a resource that can allow you to breed dragons for your army. Now on to the bad news. The AI does cheat. On the normal difficulty setting at least, settlers belonging to the other great mages have extra movement points. During one turn, a settler moved from within the fog of war two spaces into my view and then founded a city. Assuming that he was on the hex just outside of view, that would have taken three movement points, while settlers only have two. I have also noticed during War with AI that sometimes units will simply appear out of thin air. Some instances of this are the result of a visual glitch due to units moving out of the fog of war, but other times units move too much or appear to be too far away from the fog of war for that to be possible. 
The AI can be a bit wonky at times, though, as well, so it's probably just to balance it out. One time, I was in the middle of assaulting a capital city when the great mage of that side suddenly decided that he really felt like attacking a nearby neutral side, sending off one of his lords, leaving his capital far less well protected. The AI great mages are much less insane than the leaders in Civ V as far as diplomacy goes. Their appreciation of you will slowly decline over time, but you can improve your relationship with them and put off the chances of war with them by providing them with gifts, sharing their religion, trading with them, or entering into non-aggression pacts or alliances. Unlike the core Civ V, where practically every AI seems to pretend to be friends with you until they attack, you can see exactly where you stand and why with each of the great mages. This can help you decide who to go, go to war with first, if you're playing for conquest, or let you know ahead of time when you need to start patching up some relationships if you're going for a more diplomatic victory. There are four victory conditions you can aim for, each of which can be toggled on or off when setting up your game. There is Defeat the Great Mages, which requires that you be the last Great Mage to keep your capital. Incidentally, if you lose your capital in any game, you lose the game. The second is Defeat an Avatar. In the game, you can foster a relationship with one of the many deities. This gives you access to new spells and special units, but the opposing deity will get angry with you and deny you access to their spells and units. If you reach the max relationship with one of the deities, the opposing deity will manifest themselves as an avatar eventually to spite you. Defeat the avatar, and you win. The third victory condition is to cast the unity spell. The unity spell can only be researched once you have learned all of the other spells in the game. It's sort of like the science victory in Civilization. And finally, there's the capture 50% of the Holy Grounds victory. You can only build temples to the gods on Holy Grounds, so if you're trying to curry enough favor with a deity to get the defeat and Avatar ending, you'll want to disable this victory condition to avoid accidentally winning too soon. Overall, the game is very entertaining. The monsters and underworlds keep the game interesting and challenging even when you're not in active war with your rival great mages. I would definitely recommend this game to anyone who enjoys the 4X genre. And if you're curious about the genre, the relaxed difficulty level can give you a good introduction to the controls and concepts in a fairly low-stress environment.